a $2.5 million investment down the drain, a switch in business models that didn't end up fruitful. Why did Zip's wine fall off the vine so abruptly after Shark Tank? Stay tuned to find out. The idea for Zip's wine was simple. Andrew McMurray and partner J. Henry Scott teamed up to provide the world with the wine alternative to a can of beer. And just like that, Zip's wine became one of the most talked about products to ever debut on Shark Tank. So why did it seemingly disappear as suddenly as it arrived? It certainly seemed like a sure thing to Shark Tank entrepreneur Kevin O'Leary when McMurray appeared on the 11th episode of Shark Tank's sixth season in 2014. Sold in a plastic package shaped like a wine glass with patented shrink wrap that helped shield the wine from UV rays, McMurray asked for a $2.5 million investment for a 10% stake in his company. McMurray fielded many inquiries about his business from the Sharks before eventually landing a deal with Kevin O'Leary. According to Just Wine, Kevin O'Leary's investment in Zips Wine was the biggest ever Shark Tank investment at the time of the recording. O'Leary, a self-proclaimed wine connoisseur and vineyard owner, was so excited about the deal that he tweeted about it. He guaranteed success for Zips Wine if he could get it into Costco, where he thought it would be a perfect fit. I'm betting that single-serve technology, this technology, is going to revolutionize the wine industry. Unfortunately, the product never made it onto Costco's shelves. According to Small Business Journal, Zips Wine failed to generate profits in the first couple of years after the deal, even though sales appeared to have been doing great. Andrew McMurray decided that peddling wine, quote, was simply not going to work with so many better established brands to choose from, and the business model needed to change. So Shark Tank's largest catch shifted to being a business-to-business -business packaging company focused on its patented design rather than a business-to-consumer company that sold wine. This meant Zips could partner with winemakers to package their wines instead of competing with them for the same market share. McMurray explained the idea to Small Business Journal, adding, It turned our competitors into endorsers of our product, the packaging. Instead of competing with the best brands in the industry, they were now advertising our product when they put their wine in our bottles. Just how successful the packaging approach turned out to be is unclear, but it appears the business didn't last. Shark Tank tales say that 2019 marked the last of Zips' marketing efforts. The Zips website was reportedly dormant as of 2021. That may come as a surprise to some fans of Shark Tank, given how promising the pitch seemed to be. When sharks and entrepreneurs shake hands at the end of a Shark Tank episode, it may seem like the deal is sealed and success is guaranteed. But it turns out that this sort of thing isn't out of the ordinary, as there's a lot more work that happens once the cameras are off. After the episode ends, the investors need to re-verify the claims the entrepreneurs made on camera and agree once again on the terms of the investment. In fact, some on-camera handshakes never actually materialize into deals on paper. Damon John, one of the Sharks, estimated that only about 60 to 80 percent of the deals made in the show's first seven seasons actually ended up happening. In particular, food and beverage companies that have appeared on Shark Tank have found investment success to be elusive. Another wine company called B Divine Honey Wine appeared on the show in 2020 and made a four-way deal with multiple sharks. Ultimately, though, according to Shark Tank blog, this deal never closed and the investment never took place. Unlike Zips Wine, the company still seems to be afloat. This is also what happened to Sanaya Applesauce after Shark Tank. The founder's deal with shark Mark Cuban was never finalized. But when a deal with a shark does come to fruition, the results can be significant. A kitchen sponge called the Scrub Daddy is one of the most successful innovations to come out of the tank. According to Investopedia, since shark Lori Grenier invested in 2012, the company has made more than $200 million in sales. The publicity of appearing on Shark Tank can also help, as Zips Wine discovered. Since we aired on the show, we have seen a significant spike in sales. For Zips Wine, sales sat at around $650,000 prior to the company's appearance on the show, according to the Shark Tank blog. After O'Leary's handshake, the company estimated sales hit $2 million. Unfortunately for Zips Wine, though, that wasn't enough to keep the booze or the money flowing. Tortilla chips are a versatile, salty snack perfect for almost any occasion. But what if using better corn made the already delicious tortilla chip even better? That's what Cameron Sheldrake, farmer and entrepreneur, asked. One of the crops grown on his Ithaca-based, family-owned farm was sweet corn, the yellow and white checkered cobs you see at farm stands during the summer months. With excess corn during the harvest going to waste, Sheldrake decided to invent a new kind of chip, off-the-cob tortilla chips. While most corn chips are made from grain corn, a starchier, less sweet variety, Sheldrake's used only fresh-picked sweet corn, which makes for what he described as a chip with less starch and more natural, better-tasting flavors. 
In 2012, Sheldrake launched a Kickstarter campaign with the goal of $15,000 as his initial phase of funding. With the success of the campaign, Sheldrake went looking for additional capital for a massive distribution launch, which brought him to Shark Tank in 2014. If I don't get a deal from the sharks, I don't know what I'll do. In Season 6, Episode 10, he pitched to the Shark Tank panel asking for $100,000 for a 15% stake in Off the Cob. Sheldrake demonstrated the differences in both grain and sweet corn, explaining why his fresh sweet corn made for better chips. He stated that he managed to get the chips into several Whole Foods and Wegmans stores. Guest judge Nick Woodman, founder of GoPro Cameras, loved the packaging and the name of the company. And even though Lori Grenier claimed she doesn't typically eat tortilla chips, she was especially fond of the snack. Sheldrake told the Sharks he'd earned $45,000 after being in business for 13 months and still had yet to turn a profit. Most companies use grain corn because its flour costs just cents per pound, while Sheldrake revealed he was purchasing sweet corn flour at $5.50 per pound. Kevin O'Leary dropped out quickly because, in his opinion, the flavor difference wasn't enough to justify the cost of using sweet corn. The other panelists, including Mark Cuban and Damon John, also opted out, leaving Sheldrake to walk away without a deal. A company story rarely ends with Shark Tank, even when there's no deal. The publicity for a product can often spur new sales and catch the attention of investors. Thankfully, this was the case for Off the Cobb. In a 2017 interview with local SYR, Sheldrake explained that after the episode aired, he saw a massive spike in orders, which depleted Off the Cobb's stock for two months. He also revealed that the company's annual revenue was six times what it was when he appeared on Shark Tank. According to a 2018 post on Instagram, the Shark Tank boom was overwhelming, but they managed. The post read, We had just enough money to fill the orders and stretched each dollar as far as it could go. Local SYR also reported that, at the time, off-the-cob tortilla chips could be found in over 300 grocery stores and were available to purchase directly from the company's website. By all accounts, the company seemed to be a success story more than three years after its Shark Tank appearance. Even businesses with a ton of momentum and a solid product can still be brought down, and sadly, as of 2023, Off the Cob is no more. The company's official website has been taken down, grocery stores no longer stock the chips, and Off the Cob products are listed as currently unavailable on Amazon. No official reason for the company's closure has been released to the public, but it seems likely that the massive costs of fresh, organic sweet corn became too much to manage. This can often happen when entrepreneurs' farmers make a byproduct from excess crops, as Sheldrake did with Off the Cob. Consequently, they must find more external inventory from other growers at a significant markup. Also, Off the Cob used fresh shucked sweet corn, which may have come with unusual preservation, processing, and manufacturing needs that forced the price too high. Ultimately, many consider tortilla chips nothing more than affordable vehicles for salsa and guacamole, so the steep price of Off the Cob was likely hard to justify. Could canned coffee be the best thing since sliced bread, or have its customers gotten burned? While Hotshot might seem like a pretty generic moniker, the name of this product was fairly descriptive. Not only was it canned coffee, but the liquid inside the cans was actually hot. The product came from a kind of mini hot fridge called a hot box that people would need to buy to prevent their Hotshot canned coffees from turning into cold shots, or worse, lukewarm shots. Hotshot founder Danny Grossfeld discovered such an appliance on a trip to Japan in 2008 and felt that hot canned coffee would be a hit in the US as well. In true entrepreneurial spirit, however, he decided to one-up the Japanese canned coffee industry and make his coffee even hotter. His products would be sold at a fairly robust 140 degrees, while those sold in Japan typically come in at around 110 degrees. By the time Grossfeld presented his product on Shark Tank in 2015, he'd yet to sell a single can and was only accepting pre-orders. Inc. characterized Hotshot as the weakest pitch in the show's history, so it came as no surprise when none of the sharks bit. Despite the fact that he had spent six years and two million dollars perfecting a product without making a single sale, he wasn't laughed off the Shark Tank set when he arrived to make his pitch. In fact, he didn't even apply to be on the show, but had been personally invited by one of the producers after they read an article about his innovative business idea. Grossfeld, having nothing to lose at this point, offered to sell 10% of the equity in his company for $300,000. The Sharks all drank the coffee and liked it, but none of them were interested in investing. 
After hearing that Grossfeld tried to sell a sizable stake in a company with zero sales, guest shark Chris Saka stepped in. I can't tell whether you're pitching or asking for therapy. Mark Cuban, however, was a bit more encouraging. Cuban, whom Grossfeld described as super sweet to me and very receptive, made a tentative offer to sell the product on a trial basis in his landmark theaters once it actually got off the ground. Even though Grossfeld's pitch was rejected by the Sharks, his product did receive a post-show sales bump of sorts. While this wasn't anything really phenomenal, within a week there were 200 pre-orders for this as-yet-to-be-released product. Grossfeld also received offers from the AMC, Cinemark, and Regal movie chains, all wanting to test his coffee in early 2016. By that point, though, he still didn't have anything nailed down regarding Cuban's landmark chain. Three years later, things were really looking up. As the company said in a 2018 press release, concessionaires are proving to be a great channel for Hotshot. At the time, the product was available at venues as prestigious as Madison Square Garden and Disney World, as well as certain Broadway theaters. By that point, the company was beginning to expand into home sales as well, with the canned coffee and heating units being sold by both Bed Bath & Beyond and Amazon. The product, however, was not a hit with consumers. During the few years Hotshot was available online, it only racked up 10 Amazon ratings and a 3.2 star average. By all appearances, Hotshot Coffee may have rolled out its last can some time ago. The company website no longer exists, nor is it active on social media. You can Google Hotshot Coffee and come up with results, but neither an Oregon-based roastery nor coffee shops in Alaska and California seem to have any connection to the canned coffee product that appeared on Shark Tank. Allegedly, hotshot boxes could still be spotted in some concession venues as late as summer 2021. As for the exact reason why hotshot disappeared, it may have come down to the reason so many businesses go under. They simply don't sell enough of the product to make a sufficient profit. This is mere conjecture, however, since there is no official word regarding the company's current status. Food inventions are among the most common pitches on Shark Tank, but some can't swim with the sharks. If Julia Child taught us anything, it is that everything tastes better with butter. One inventor took this a step further and invented a gadget that makes a regular stick of butter sprayable. So which one of you is ready to join us and help us to make the world a butter place? Lori Grenier invested a whopping $500,000 in a product that was expected to sell thousands of units. But it wasn't long before things started to fall apart. The Better Business Bureau received more than 30 complaints about their $130 sprayers malfunctioning and return policies not being honored. Grenier's company released a statement reading, Lori Grenier has no affiliation with this company. She did not make an investment after the Shark Tank episode aired because they did not have a working prototype during due diligence, so Lori passed on the deal. Danny Grossfeld found inspiration for his hot coffee in a can in Japan. But the Sharks believed the U.S. ready-to-drink coffee market was too saturated. Hot Shot is a series of coffees in special cans with insulated labels to protect your hands from the 140-degree liquid inside. You're never going to have to make another cup of coffee or wait in line ever again. The catch was that the cans needed to be stored in a patented hot box. Although the Sharks were all out, Mark Cuban gave the entrepreneur hope by saying he would consider testing the product in his theaters. But the $6 billion Japanese market didn't translate to the States after launching on Amazon. Many Amazon consumers believed their cans would arrive hot and unaware of the hot box put the final nail in the coffee can. On Shark Tank Season 7, entrepreneurs Adam Gerber and Bob Natoya had an idea to change the face of healthy eating for kids. My Fruity Faces was a sheet of edible stickers kids could stick onto fruit and veggies to create fun characters. Despite the adorable toddlers that demonstrated the product, the creators failed to land the $200,000 investment they needed. The Sharks tore their idea to shreds and found quite a few cracks in their business model. The creators were close to $100,000. $80,000 in debt and had only $2,000 in sales in the month leading up to their pitch. The last bit of bait they could throw at the Sharks was a Nickelodeon licensing deal allowing them to print characters like SpongeBob or Dora the Explorer, but the deal had expired. Mark Cuban enjoyed the product, but he didn't want to try and find out what was wrong with the company. My Fruity Faces shut down in 2018. Here's a hot tip. When entering the tank, don't get the sharks hopped up on caffeine. 
the sharks were hungry for blood, attacking each other and the creator of Wired Waffles. Roger Sullivan created this fusion to give consumers their daily dose of caffeine inside a delicious treat. Unfortunately, one waffle had enough caffeine to power a small truck. The sharks were unimpressed by the dry, stodgy texture and icky taste of the item. But there were also logistical issues. Roger, did you put anything on it to make it taste better? Lori noted that the waffles posed a safety hazard, as kids could easily be duped into eating the product with its dangerously high levels of caffeine. Sullivan admittedly sold only $1,000 worth of wired waffles in the month before the taping. He claimed the waffles were stale and cold because he had to unwrap them 30 minutes before his pitch. But liability concerns and low sale figures were red flags for the sharks. The company folded in 2015. Millions of women suffer from PMS-related symptoms, including food cravings. This hankering for sweet stuff was something Tanya Green wanted to take control of. She created a healthy vegan alternative to sugary snacks made with dates and cocoa, then infused them with herbs to allegedly combat PMS. PMS bites ticked all the boxes – healthy, delicious, and easy to produce. But it wasn't enough for the sharks. Even though Green was only seeking $50,000 and was willing to part with 20% of her company, the sharks believed the market segment was too small. Barbara Corcoran criticized Tanya's energy, explaining that a salesperson needed more oomph. I hear the words, not the music. I am out. Mark Cuban suggested that she focus more on social media marketing than landing in-store deals. Tanya went on to sell her product in around 15 stores, but never achieved the commercial success she hoped for. The company closed in 2018. The taste of chocolatey milk at the bottom of a cereal bowl takes us back to the good old days. However, Cow Wow cereal milk only takes us back to season 5 of Shark Tank. Tiffany Panhillison and Chris Poy invented a cereal-flavored milk to promote milk consumption among kids. Unfortunately, one 8-ounce box of Cow Wow had more calories than a 12-ounce can of 7-Up. Do you realize how bad you just screwed up? The first shark to jump ship was Damon John, but he's lactose intolerant. Mark Cuban explained that big cereal and milk producers could take over the industry in a heartbeat and leave Cow Wow with crumbs. Lori, Steve, and Kevin also disliked the product, and the Cow Wow team left without a deal. The creators put Cow Wow out to pasture in 2014. Who can forget the morning Michael Scott burned his foot on the George Foreman grill? I like waking up to the smell of bacon, sue me. One man's dream to wake to the smell of bacon became another man's mission. So Maddie Salen brought his bacon-making alarm clock to the tank, hoping the sharks would take the bait. His adorable wooden clock seemed like a carnivore's dream, and it even bore the slogan, Rise and Swine. But there was a flaw in his plan. Kevin O'Leary got straight to the point, calling Maddie out on his lack of projections. You got a pig box that's gonna catch on fire and kill somebody. I'm gonna be sued in the Stone Age. I'm out. Then there was the hygiene factor, since you'd have to leave raw meat on your bedside table overnight. But Maddie's ultimate downfall was that he only had a prototype. The sharks want products with a proven sales history and a well structured business plan. Wake and Bacon never made it into production. Our cardiologists, thank you, sharks. The term cougar is loaded with innuendo, but Ryan Custer was eager to market his energy drink to mature women. This energy shot was loaded with extracts from 13 different superfruits and was said to aid in weight loss, keep your hormones balanced, help with hair and nail health, and give you a five-hour energy kick. It wasn't a hit with the sharks, though. Their arguments ranged from the size of the market to the taste of the product. When Ryan went into the tank, He'd sold just $60,000 of product in three years. Barbara Corcoran described the taste as chalky, and Kevin O'Leary broke down the numbers, explaining that around 75% of the market was excluded from the, quote, cougar demographic. Isn't a cougar typically older? Because she looks younger than you are. Well, she's been drinking the cougar, the, <laughs> yeah. the cougar <laughs> shot for a while. Ryan left the tank without a deal and continued to sell his product online. But Amazon reviews like, this is offensive to women and chalkboard aftertaste, overwhelming sweetness, didn't do him any favors. Cougar energy quietly bowed out of the market soon after the show aired.
A common thread among failed Shark Tank food inventions is entrepreneurs trying to reinvent the wheel but breaking it instead. They make wet things dry, sweet things salty, and drinks chewable. Michael Brandt and Jeffrey Wu wanted us to replace our coffee routines with a performance-enhancing caffeine gummy. Biohacking, as the inventors describe it, would help you tap into your true potential and make you more mentally alert. According to the packaging, two cubes would substitute for one cup of coffee. And the product came in three flavors, latte, mocha, and pure drip. The biggest shock came when the Go Cubes creators asked for a $2 million investment for only 5% equity. But okay, but why is why, this why actually, is this cube worth $40 million? At the time, the amount was a Shark Tank record, but the caffeinated cubes didn't get the sharks going, and they all quickly stepped out. Some worried about long-term health effects while others were unimpressed with the stiff delivery of the pitch and the massive valuation. GoCube sold online for a while, but the company eventually rebranded itself as Human and found more success selling brain-boosting nutritional supplements. When a pitch starts with a cringy rap, we know we're in for a wild ride. Jennifer and Michael Gallagher had us blushing, laughing, cringing, and crying all in the span of a few minutes. The pair created the world's first aphrodisiac bar, which was designed to be a lifestyle supplement and increase one's libido with continual ingestion. Their secret ingredient was maca root, which Jennifer claimed is called Peruvian Viagra. The bars failed to excite the sharks and the pair were left high and dry. The company had only $2,000 in sales by the time of filming, and they completely shut down shortly after their episode aired. It's a bad sign for a new food invention when the idea sounds so gross you have to beg your audience to try it. Pizza cupcakes and burnt cheese snacks are one thing, but beer-flavored ice cream is a bit harder to swallow. Brewer's Cow Ice Cream was 10 years in the making before Steve Albert, Larry Blackwell, and Jason Conroy took their tubs into the tank. The trio was dealt a bad hand with Damon John being there that day, as he famously steps away from any dairy products. The other sharks loved the flavor, but it wasn't enough to win them over. As Kevin O'Leary and Mark Cuban started to grill them on sales figures, the pitch ran away from the Brewer's Cow team. They struggled to recite projections, expense figures, and profit margins. This is an unfortunate case where the business model didn't back up a great product. There are certain things in every business you gotta know every morning when you wake up, and one of them is, what do I need to do in order to break even? Their episode aired in 2012, and the company folded around two years later. Securing a deal in the tank isn't the one-way ticket to paradise many might assume. A shark's handshake isn't binding, and they reserve the right to back out of a deal if they smell something fishy during due diligence. Plate Topper had everything Lori Grenier could possibly look for in a product, and she smelled money. It was simple, easy, cheap to manufacture, and solved a problem millions of people have – food storage. Michael Sang came into the tank seeking a $90,000 investment, but was only willing to part with 5% of his company. Grenier was able to squeeze 8% out of Sang, and the entrepreneur left the tank thinking he'd sealed his fate. But wait, there's more. <laughs> Lori had difficulty working with Sang, and she had some interesting thoughts during an AMA session on Reddit. She wrote, Plate topper guy was stubborn and didn't listen to anything anyone had to say. Same in the tank. Can't go forward with that. Shark Tank Tales noted that Lori tweeted a follow-up remark the day the episode aired, writing, Sorry to say, I wound up not liking his tactics much either. That agony didn't end in the tank. I'm out. The plate topper went out of business, but Prestagon LLC has various other kitchen and homeware products available on Amazon that seem to be doing well. Shark Tank provides a platform for entrepreneurs to showcase concepts and products we can't live without. But occasionally, a product slips through that's only good for a laugh. Our product is a never-seen-before, revolutionary cooking lifestyle convenience product. The cooking cap was one of these head-scratching inventions, but inventors Julie DeVoe and Ozma Khan had their sights set on being as big as the Snuggie. This Bo Peep style bonnet was supposed to keep cooking smells out of your hair. The biggest snag, as Lori pointed out, was that there was no discernible difference between the cooking cap and a regular shower cap. If you wanted to look silly in the kitchen, you probably wouldn't spend an extra $12 to do so. Barbara also pointed out that the caps had a flammable warning, despite the lady saying the product was flame resistant. 
Ozma and Julie left empty-handed. They made a last-ditch effort with online sales, but the company closed a few months later after their episode aired. When a former attorney put it all on the line to start a new business in the risky beverage industry, he certainly had his work cut out for him. Were the sharks eager to get in on the action? And what has happened to the company since? Jim Otteson created Luma Soda in January 2017. He had been a big diet soda drinker, but Otteson noticed his beverage of choice was fairly unhealthy, so he set out to create a soda that didn't contain chemicals or sugar. Not only did Luma Sodas have zero sugar, but they were also free of artificial colors, caffeine, and aspartame. At a at the price of $19.99, Otteson sold 12 packs of four flavors – cola, cherry cola, blood orange, and lemon lime. Per Palo Alto Online, Otteson said quitting his job and investing in Luma Soda was scary. However, he added, we've gotten a lot of great feedback. People are really excited about it. I think it's a great product. Airing in 2019, Otteson headed into the Shark Tank during Season 10, looking for some help in getting his soda into major supermarkets and grocery stores. He asked the Sharks for a $500,000 investment for 20% equity in his company. At the time of his appearance, he had invested $1.75 million of his own money and had just $30,000 remaining in the bank. What's more, he only had $180,000 in sales. As he made his pitch, the Sharks began to wrinkle their brows with worried looks on their faces. Despite their concerns, Barbara Corcoran seemed interested at first, stating she would give $250,000 to Otteson and Luma Soda if beverage expert Shark Rohan Oza would partner with her. In an attempt to convince Oza to invest with her, she said, I know less about the soda business than certainly you do, but I know a good guy when I see it. He's a great guy. He's rock solid. I Oza, however, was worried about the amount invested versus how much the small company had made in sales. He decided to bow out, and thus so did Corcoran. Otteson left the show without a deal. Even though he walked away from Shark Tank empty-handed, Luma Soda's founder continued to push the business agenda of his healthy soda company, but his efforts quickly proved futile. It appears that there were no changes to the product, no expansion of merchandise, and no new investors in the company. Otteson pledged to keep Luma Soda alive, regardless of any hardships he might face. He over overhauled the company's Amazon store and conducted several online promotions, but it wasn't enough to keep the business afloat. He was never able to get his product into any stores, which was likely a major barrier to garnering sales. Luma Soda's Facebook account has been inactive since September 2018. One user looking for the product in 2020 asked if the company was still operating, but they never received a reply. The Luma Soda website is also defunct. Perhaps it's not surprising that Luma Soda failed to succeed in the cutthroat non-alcoholic beverage sector without financing from Shark Tank industry heavyweights. After all, the Shark Tank investors have often cited the beverage industry as among the most difficult to survive in due to overwhelming competition. Luma was up against multiple popular soda brands, including Coca-Cola, Nestle, and PepsiCo. Also, there is one competitor that may have proved problematic for Luma Soda, Poppy Sparkling Prebiotic Soda. Not only does this brand contain healthy prebiotics and apple cider vinegar, but it is sweetened with fruit juice. LinkedIn lists Jim Otteson's ending date as founder and CEO of Luma Soda as January 2019. He had been an attorney for 26 years before quitting to develop Luma Soda, and the company's final Facebook post was published eight days before he took up the role of senior counsel at Deckard LLP, according to his Facebook profile. According to LinkedIn, he then went on to found Otteson Law. Otteson is now listed as a managing director at Major Lindsay and Africa, a recruitment company for legal professionals. As of this time, there are notable no mentions of any more business experiments from Otteson, particularly ones related to craft sodas. The beer blizzard ensured that when you cracked open a cold one with the boys, that cold one would stay cold. So why didn't this product last? Entrepreneurs Tom Osborne and Mike Robb were tired of how quickly their beers were going warm, and koozies alone weren't enough to solve this problem. In an interview with the Cincinnati Inquirer, the duo explained that the beer blizzard came about after they tried packing ice cubes into the bottom of a beer koozie. The ice cubes made a watery mess as they melted, leading Osborne and Rob to start thinking about a reusable ice pack. And so, the beer blizzard was born. The project raised over $43,000 on Kickstarter, and its success prompted an appearance on Shark Tank in 2016. Osborne and Rob asked the Sharks for a $100,000 investment in exchange for 20% equity, hoping to take their product national. They pitched their product as the solution for cooling beer faster than ever, 
joking that they had caused a lot of hangovers, but also solved a problem for beer drinkers everywhere. America, you are welcome. The Beer Blizzard Ice Pack fits into the indentation at the bottom of a can. As Osborne and Rob explained, without cooling, beer stays cold for roughly six minutes. The Beer Blizzard increased that time frame to 21 minutes. While the sharks weren't convinced it was the Beer Blizzard ice disc doing the cooling and not the koozie, they were nevertheless interested in cashing in on the beer-drinking populace. After learning about how Beer Blizzard had more than $156,000 in sales in its first year, Mark Cuban offered an investment of $100,000 in exchange for 25% equity. Osborne and Rob accepted the deal, but their Beer Blizzard journey was only getting started. The Beer Blizzard saw an enormous increase in sales after its episode aired. Osborne and Rob never closed their deal with Mark Cuban, but that didn't stop them from getting their product into retail chains like Walmart, Target, and Bed Bath & Beyond. What's more, as the Sharks had recommended during the pitch, Beer Blizzard got into brand deal negotiations with NASCAR driver Dale Earnhardt Jr. Unfortunately, this deal never went through, and Beer Blizzard was left out in the cold. As such, Osborne and Rob continued to sell primarily online, charging $13 for a package of six ice packs and $20 for 12. The Beer Blizzard held steady, with an Amazon rating of 3.4 stars, as several customers complained about the price point and how the ice pack requires a koozie to keep it in place. Beer Blizzard made its final social media post in early 2018, though the company said nothing about going out of business. A few Instagram users commented that Beer Blizzard had taken their money but never shipped their order. Others called the company a scam, saying no one would respond to their emails or DMs. Sadly, for anyone hoping to cool their next sip of beer with a Beer Blizzard, the creators seem to have returned to their respective careers. Osborne as a food safety director and Rob as an attorney. While no one can say with certainty what happened behind the scenes, we can only assume that Beer Blizzard was just as much a one-hit wonder as shark Robert Herjavec suggested. With Beer Blizzard ice packs no longer available for purchase, you may be wondering how you can keep your beer or soda cold without freezing it. Although no one has quite replicated the Beer Blizzard, other entrepreneurs have created products with similar purposes. Amazon is packed with single-can coolers, which essentially combine a koozie with an insulated thermos. No ice packs are involved, so you have to start with a cold can. Otherwise, it is somewhat reminiscent of the Beer Blizzard. If you're looking for something a little closer to the original Beer Blizzard, there is a product that's quite similar on Amazon. Cool or not, Blizzard Beer Chiller may not have been featured on Shark Tank, but it is highly rated and appears to function in the same way as the Beer Blizzard. It takes ingenuity, charisma, and a darn good product to stand out on Shark Tank. But just because you managed to get the shark's attention, that doesn't mean they're going to take a bite. Luckily, that didn't stop maple syrup maestro Joshua Parker from tapping his dreams. When business owners enter the Shark Tank, they're well aware that they may not walk away with a deal. Even those who don't score a deal tend to see an uptick in sales due to the publicity from millions of viewers watching their episode. Joshua Parker was only 18 years old when he entered the tank to pitch his company, Parker's Real Maple, to Kevin O'Leary, Robert Herchevec, Barbara Corcoran, Lori Grenier, and Mark Cuban. I love everything about maple syrup. The texture, the flavor, the process it takes to make it. While diving into the tank at any age seems intimidating, one would think it would be extra daunting for a kid fresh out of high school. It didn't appear to be the case for Joshua Parker, who seemed calm, cool, and collected, even when hit with some tough love from the Sharks. What made Parker's pitch so appealing was both his passion for maple products and that he had three years of business experience prior to coming on the tank. Even though all the sharks welcomed Parker with a warm reception and enjoyed his products, the final decision was not what Parker had hoped for. Parker's episode aired on October 21, 2016, during season eight. When he entered the tank, he shared his story with the sharks. When I was 11 years old, I went on a school field trip to learn how maple syrup is made. Where I expected to find a fun afternoon, I found something else entirely. 
In 2013, he launched his business from his family's farm with only 25 gallons of syrup. Business took off, and by the time he reached the tank, he had accrued over $300,000 in sales of maple syrup and maple-flavored products. Parker entered the tank asking for a $200,000 investment for 20% of his business. Even though all the sharks loved the maple products, the lack of potential for growth made them a little uneasy. The product margins also weren't great, with a bottle costing over $8 to make and selling for $11.99. Parker explained to them that he was selling more than maple products. It was about the brand. He also mentioned that he had interest from Costco in carrying his product, but the sharks weren't buying it. Despite how impressed the sharks were with the then 18-year-old Parker, they believed he was overestimating the product's potential growth, and ultimately the business's profit margins were too small for them to bite. In 2019, on the company's website, Parker described how Parker's Maple fared after his appearance on Shark Tank. Even though he didn't get a deal, he looked back fondly on his time in the tank and on the advice the sharks gave him. Immediately following the Shark Tank appearance, Parker's real Maple boomed and they received over 7,000 orders in the week following the episode. Parker explained on his site, "'This was more than I could have ever imagined. And if you've been a customer long enough since that week, you know that it took us a long time to get most of the orders out.'" After the initial Shark Tank success, Parker was determined not to join the ranks of companies that don't capitalize on the Shark Tank bump and end up going out of business. He succeeded in keeping the dream alive, and the amount of orders and sheer volume became too great to continue producing at the family farm. Parker's Real Maple Syrup moved production in 2017 to another location in his hometown. Parker's Maple had a $10 million valuation by 2020. In June of that year, Parker's Real Maple was acquired by the Forest Farmers, a company started by Michael Farrell, one of Parker's earliest teachers and mentors. The Forest Farmers had over 10,000 acres over two locations in New York and Vermont. Parker's Real Maple continues to be a major player in the syrup business, which is estimated to be worth over $2 billion by 2028. Parker's Real Maple variety of syrups, maple butter, and maple cotton candy are available at national grocers like Whole Foods, Walmart, and HEB. The company hasn't had a strong social media presence since 2021 when it launched the Maple Syrup Squeeze Bottle. The latest product launch appears to have been in 2022, when the company introduced a naturally reduced sugar version of maple syrup. It's unclear if Joshua Parker still works for Forest Farmers, but we can only hope he's still pursuing his dreams and enjoying his maple syrup. When the founders of Mango Mango appeared on Shark Tank in 2013, Things were forever changed for the small business. But was it for the better? Entrepreneurs Tanisia Willis, Lakeisha Brown Renfro, and Nzinga Teule Heikima started their business while Brown Renfro's husband was deployed overseas. Initially, they sold their mango preserves at local farmers markets. But as the product gained popularity, the women needed help expanding the business. At the time of their appearance on Shark Tank, they had already accepted space in several Whole Foods locations making $100,000 in sales in 2012 alone. However, if Mango Mango was going to scale up, the trio needed both guidance and financial help. With that in mind, a Shark Tank investment seemed like the best way to go. During their pitch to the Shark Tank investors, the three founders asked for an investment of $75,000 in exchange for a 20% equity stake. They presented several dishes using their mango preserves, and the sharks loved the taste. After trying a shrimp dish enhanced with Mango Mango, Robert Herchevik raved. Lakeisha, this shrimp is fantastic. Additionally, the trio demonstrated various uses for their products, including flavoring lemonade, spreading on baked goods, making homemade dips, sweetening vinaigrette, and creating unique sauces. Mango Mango only uses four ingredients, mango, sugar, vanilla, and lime juice. This simple recipe makes it extremely versatile across all kinds of cuisines. Despite the enthusiasm for this tasty product, none of the sharks offered Mango Mango a deal, and the trio ultimately left the tank empty-handed. However, they had come too far to let Shark Tank be the end of the Mango Mango story, and they pushed forward with their business, even without an investment. I rarely say this. I don't think it's good for you to actually give away equity to a shark. A company that appears on Shark Tank can still experience the show's effects regardless of whether or not they land a deal. Such was the case for Mango Mango. The business reportedly received more than 15,000 orders within 48 hours of the episode airing, 
totaling more than $100,000 and nearly $300,000 in sales. Per USA Today, the trio behind Mango Mango had to ask their friends and family for assistance in fulfilling orders. Even with the extra help, it took about six months for all 15,000 orders to be shipped out to customers. Some of their newfound revenue went toward a bistro called Mango Mango, which they opened in 2016 in Hampton, Virginia. The restaurant offers brunch, catering, and even space for private events. It also provides more room for the production of mango preserves. And of course, many of the bistro's menu items feature the mango mango that started it all. With all this success, it probably comes as no surprise to learn that the company is thriving in 2023. As of 2022, the business had brought in more than $1 million in sales, with no signs of slowing. According to USA Today, the trio's bistro makes more than $100,000 a month and has 45 employees. Its food and staff are clearly beloved by the community, with a Google rating of 4.3 as of this video. As for the original Mango Mango Preserves, you are able to purchase a 16-ounce glass jar for $19.99 through the company's website. You can also buy preserves at the bistro should you be in the area. But regardless of where Mango Mango is sold, what matters is that customers are still buying it and using it in all sorts of creative and tasty dishes. In addition to making their Mango Mango Preserves and operating their bistro, the trio have also opened their own nail bar, petty spa, and boutique hotel. Brown Renfro was running the businesses full-time as of 2020. Teule Heikima was still balancing the production of their mango preserves with her family practice, and Willis has her healthcare IT consulting. Clearly, the Mango Mango trio know what they want from life, and there is no reason to believe they will stop. Mango lovers everywhere can rejoice knowing this delicious product is still going strong today, with a future that looks as bright as ever. The sharks were ready to bite when this vegan chicken company was presented to them, but the company's founder walked away. Was that the right move? The demand for plant-based meat has skyrocketed over the years as more people have adopted a vegan or vegetarian lifestyle. As of 2019, there are nearly 10 million vegans in the United States, compared to only 290,000 in 2004, according to an Ipsos study. And in recent years, food companies from Beyond Meat to Impossible Foods have released a slew of vegetarian proteins for plant-based customers and open-minded omnivores. Another one of these companies is Atlas Monroe, a vegan food producer based in San Francisco. The founder and CEO, Deborah Torres, started the company after her father was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. She helped him make the switch to a raw vegan diet for 30 days, which inspired her to create a company that makes creative and exciting plant-based dishes. Torres appeared on Season 11, Episode 2 of Shark Tank, alongside her brother, Jonathan. At the time, their goal was to buy a facility to fulfill orders for their growing business. But after the judges sampled some of the company's famous fried chicken, they ended up declining the shark's $1 million offer. She felt that the amount was not high enough, estimating that her business would eventually rake in $24 million. The episode of Shark Tank aired in October of 2019, and ever since, Atlas Monroe has been exploding with success. The company is constantly selling out of its goods, even though its owners now have the multi-million dollar facility they had always wanted. According to the press and media section of its website, Atlas Monroe has also won multiple awards and accolades at fried chicken festivals. When Deborah Torres appeared on Shark Tank, Mark Cuban and Rohan Oza offered her and her brother $1 million for 100% ownership of their vegan fried chicken company. Had she agreed to the deal, Torres would no longer have owned the company, but she would still be eligible to receive 10% royalties on the sale of her products moving forward. Fortunately, she saw the bigger picture. When turning down the offer, she explained to the Sharks. The dollars? fact that you guys are even offering us a million dollars just lets me know that you guys do understand You're right. what you we're worth. The year after the Shark Tank appearance, Atlas Monroe raked in $2 million in sales. In July 2021, Torres appeared on the Business for Good podcast with Paul Shapiro, where she explained that while she didn't wind up taking the Sharks' million dollar deal, the experience turned out to be quite lucrative for her and her business. Viewers were so intrigued by the product that pre-orders started rolling in. It was with that money that Torres said she was able to acquire the first manufacturing facility for Atlas Monroe in April 2021. While she says plans for a second and possibly even a third facility are in the works, the one the company has now is 
already shipping out over 20,000 pieces of vegan chicken a week. With the help of a 10,000 square foot manufacturing facility, Atlas Monroe has greatly expanded its vegan food offerings. The company is now selling more than 30 items, including applewood fired ribs, beef lasagna, Philly cheesesteaks, jerk pork, Korean barbecue pork, and fried and stuffed turkey. Atlas Monroe even offers savory sides like mac and cheese and Caribbean rice and beans, along with decadent desserts like chocolate cake. In January 2022, the company announced a massive partnership with Copper Branch, a vegan restaurant with over 40 locations across the US and Canada. Atlas Monroe products are also on the menu at several other vegan restaurants across California, Virginia, Ohio, Florida, and South Carolina. For now, Atlas Monroe foods can be purchased online. However, founder Deborah Torres has said that deals with several stores are also in the works. She told Green Matters in 2021 that California-based grocery store Bristol Farms, as well as a yet-to-be-named national grocery store chain, are set to carry the vegan products. As of this video, the deal is still in the works. Could a couple of students turn a food processor experiment into a highly successful company? The founders of Wild Squirrel Nut Butter were determined to find out. College sophomores Erica Welsh and Keely Tillotson began experimenting with their food processor and a bag of peanuts in their dorm room after running out of the pre-made stuff. After trying out new combinations for their own pleasure, they decided to market their peanut butter to the public. Neither of them went to school for business, but with $50,000 from their parents, they were able to launch the brand and make some modest earnings through farmer's market sales and direct-to-consumer online shipping. They needed more money to bring their products into brick-and-mortar grocery stores, so they took their company Wild Squirrel to Shark Tank. Airing in 2012, the two started their pitch in the episode by telling their story and allowing the sharks to try a few of their peanut butter flavors, which included chocolate espresso, cinnamon raisin, chocolate coconut, and honey pretzel. The sharks were overwhelmingly pleased with the taste, but with the duo asking for $50,000 for just a 10% stake in the young company, they weren't totally convinced this was a viable business opportunity. The young entrepreneurs were only making $1 per jar at the time. Kevin O'Leary said that they needed to make a minimum of $3 per jar in order for him to consider, adding that the pair were significantly overvaluing the new company. Robert Herjavec announced he was out, and so did Damon John and Mark Cuban. Barbara Corcoran, however, was interested in the concept and offered a deal. She told Welsh and Tillotson that she'd give them the $50,000, but for 40% instead of 10%. Her justification was that in the long term, the two would need far more than $50,000, and the 10% stake to make the company successful was not worth it. The young women attempted a counteroffer, but they ultimately went for the 40% equity deal. Despite accepting the deal on air, it was revealed that Barbara Corcoran did not move forward with the nut butter making duo. In an interview with Forbes, Keely Tillotson said, on their end, they decided not to invest, and we were glad because we were not ready. We are determined to succeed. We are both extremely hard workers. Even without Corcoran, the company did incredibly well after their appearance on the show. In an update segment on Shark Tank, the two revealed that they had just $16,000 in revenue before Shark Tank. Since then, they sold over $350,000 worth of peanut butter in under a year. The company founders also took to Circle Up to find a lead investor and raise additional funding. John Foraker, CEO of Annie's, decided to invest in the company, which led to an additional $1.4 million in backing. Since then, the company raised an additional $3.5 million and brought on former General Mills executive Beth Hansen as VP of Sales. That isn't the only seasoned executive working with the company. Its investors include Eduardo Castro Wright and Duncan Niederauer, former executives at Walmart and the New York Stock Exchange, respectively. While this peanut butter brand is alive and well, it no longer goes by Wild Squirrel. The company was hit by a lawsuit by another business called Squirrel Brand Company, which also sold nut butters. The lawsuit prompted Wild Squirrel to change its name to Wild Friends. The label's signature squirrel remains part of the company's branding, however. The company has also expanded its offerings to various other nut butters, such as sunflower and almond butter. 
Perhaps surprisingly, it dropped the quirky pretzel and espresso flavor combos, and now offers more basic options with fewer ingredients. Wild Friends is now available at Whole Foods, Costco, Walmart, and Kroger, as well as a number of other grocery stores. It also continues to offer direct-to-consumer online sales. Since appearing on Shark Tank more than 10 years ago, a lot has changed for Wild Squirrel beyond the name. The company now more strongly identifies as a clean eating brand, with its website's About page saying, We promise to always make our products with short lists of clean ingredients, excluding palm oil, excess sugar, and artificial anything. Additionally, the company has taken on its first non-profit partner with Girls Inc. Indeed, the brand has seen tremendous success, and it seems the future will continue to look bright for wild friends. In a market crowded with meal kit services, could one underdog company rise to the top? Direct-to-door meal kit delivery services seem like a staple of weeknight cooking and dining these days. HelloFresh, Blue Apron, Home Chef, and many more have made their mark as more folks look to cook at home, try new recipes, and eat healthier. But amongst these big names, there was a brand founded in 2012 called Plated that offered pre-packaged ingredients alongside easy-to-follow recipes. The founders, Nick Taranto and Josh Hicks, stated that their mission was to help Americans eat better. The duo met while attending Harvard Business School, and they both recognized a common struggle in having time and money to access high-quality meals. This is where Plated was born. Taranto and Hicks appeared on Shark Tank in 2014. After a shaky start, this team sought additional funding to better coordinate their rapidly growing company and improve their margins. And while meal kits have become popular for many home cooks, the Plated founders had to lay a lot of groundwork to convince the sharks to give them a fair shot. The Plated founders sought $500,000 for just 4% equity, an offer that shocked several judges. Taranto and Hicks explained that their business model allowed customers to enjoy convenience, less grocery cost waste, and fresh cooked meals, but the sharks seemed dubious at best. Lori Grenier asked how this service would be preferable to a direct-to-door grocery order, and Mark Cuban questioned why a recipe card accompanying the pre-portioned ingredients was any easier than thumbing through a cookbook. The founders explain that the service takes some of the mental labor out of making healthy choices, and they emphasize that their subscribers were almost all repeat customers. Customers tell us that they love the experience of getting everything pre-portioned, it's easy to make. Despite the entrepreneur's explanations, Robert Herjavec was the first shark to opt out, explaining that he just didn't see the point of a food delivery service he ultimately still had to cook. Kevin O'Leary, Lori Grenier, and Barbara Corcoran followed suit, Mark Cuban, however, wasn't so quick to jump off. He offered the requested $500,000 in exchange for roughly 6% equity, as well as advisory shares. After hesitating briefly, Taranto and Hicks agreed to the deal and shook hands with Cuban. After the episode aired, however, the deal went bust. According to an episode of Beyond the Tank, a spin-off show that follows the stories of Shark Tank contestants, Taranto and Hicks tried to renegotiate the deal they agreed to on air due to a recent sales bump, which Cuban took as a sign of a bad faith partnership. But another shark hadn't let plate it out of their sight. Although the specific terms of the agreement were not revealed, Kevin O'Leary ended up investing in the company. In addition to O'Leary's investment, it was reported that the plated founders sought funding elsewhere and had independently raised $100 million in venture capital, which put them in an excellent position to expand the company. In 2017, Plated announced that it had been acquired by grocery chain Albertsons for $300 million, with Taranto slated to stay on as chief strategy officer and Hicks as CEO. In a statement about the merger, Taranto said, We are playing for billions here. We are going to kill Blue Apron. We are going to take on Amazon Fresh. This partnership enables us to become a $10 billion brand in a matter of years. With such an amazing streak over a few years, it seemed that Plated's future was bright. But sadly, Plated is no more, at least in the form we once knew it. On Albertson's website, it's possible to create a meal plan in a model similar to Plated's and other meal kit services, but there's no mention of the Plated brand. In 2019, Plated released a statement on Twitter explaining that its subscription-based service was ending in a matter of weeks. Just before this announcement, both Taranto and Hicks had left their roles at the newly acquired Plated without public explanation. 
Interestingly, in 2021, Reuters reported that some of Plated's shareholders had brought a lawsuit against Albertsons, claiming that the grocery chain had ignored and tanked the subscription service in favor of promoting the kits in brick-and-mortar stores. One Delaware judge found this was a possibility, allowing the shareholders to pursue a specific breach of contract suit. It's entirely possible that this merger was responsible for the apparent end of Plated. Additionally, unlike Taranto predicted, Plated's partnership with Albertsons wasn't the undoing of competing meal kit delivery services. Blue Apron, Amazon Fresh, and HelloFresh are still in business, and new but similar services continue to crop up, potentially squeezing out any competitive edge Plated might have had. Tree vegetable pasta? As strange as it may sound, it was a real pitch on Shark Tank. But did the sharks bite? Whether you're conscious of your carb intake or simply seeking to incorporate more veggies into your diet, vegetable-based substitutes offer a fantastic alternative to beloved wheat-based dishes. If you frequent the grocery store, chances are you've come across products like cauliflower rice, zucchini noodles, and other vegetable substitutes offering tasty and healthier choices for your favorite dishes. With so many in-store products and homemade options available, you may be wondering if you really need another packaged or canned pasta substitute. Well, Alfonso Tejada thought so. After years of importing products like quinoa and chia seeds, he pitched his new Palmini brand to the investors on Shark Tank during Season 9, Episode 24, which aired in February of 2018. The Palmini product he pitched was a pasta substitute made from hearts of palm, which is a vegetable that comes from inside palm trees and is often found in salads, stir-fries, and marinated as a side dish or on a charcuterie board. A serving of Tejada's gluten-free pasta substitute contains 20 calories per serving, 4 grams of carbs, and is sugar-free vegan, and keto-friendly, making it suitable for many diets. The brand has also acquired BPA-free and non-GMO certifications. During the episode, Tejada faced sharks Lori Grenier, Mark Cuban, Bethany Frankel, Robert Herjavec, and Damon John. The shark sampled three palmini dishes with varied reactions. Herjavec was disappointed it didn't taste like pasta, while Grenier, well, her reaction speaks for itself. I freaking love this. Yes! During Tejada's pitch, Bethany Frankel and the other entrepreneurs debated whether the brand has long-term potential in classic shark style. Frankel expressed concern that, since the product was basically vegetables cut into a pasta-like shape, it was unclear whether the patent-pending technology would be sufficient to stand up to potential future competition. Cuban and Grenier offered $300,000 for 25% equity, a compromise from their initial proposal of 30%, though still higher than Tejada's desired 10%. Tejada, who went to college at the University of Florida, told his school's publication, The Alligator, he had only sold a couple of Palmini products per day before he appeared on Shark Tank. Within a day of the episode airing, he claims to have sold out out of stock entirely, adding, it's incredible how fast we ran out. We're planning on restocking, and then we'll see how sales go afterwards. While Palmini received an initial Sharknado of sales, that sadly doesn't always spell success for companies featured on Shark Tank. It remained to be seen whether the deal with Grenier and Cuban would lead to a sustainable future. Palmini is still going strong, with a growing product line that now includes angel hair pasta, lasagna, and linguine. The brand also expanded into other Hearts of Palm-based low-carb products like rice and a mashed potato substitute. The products come in both pouches and cans for shoppers' convenience. In addition, quinoa, chia, and yawa sauce are available under the brand GreenFit, which is also sold on the Palmini Company website and owned by the same parent company, OA Foods. Several nationwide grocery chains carry Palmini products, including Safeway, Kroger, Walmart, and Sprouts Farmers Market. Registered dietitian Amy Keating told Consumer Reports, Considering most Americans don't consume nearly enough vegetables daily, replacing hearts of palm for regular pasta is a great way to increase veggies in your diet. Though the consumer publication expressed concerns about whether the product is sustainable, Palmini claims its products are made using cultivated palm sourced from Ecuador. The company grows and harvests the heart sustainably and without killing the plant, allowing it to regrow and be harvested again. For consumers looking for more eco-friendly packaging, the cans are made with aluminum, which is recyclable. Palmini has a fairly active social media presence, showing the brand is still in the game years after that Shark Tank pitch. Fans can discover new recipes for foods like Thai tofu salad and shrimp fried rice, as well as cooking tips through the brand's TikTok. TikTok, Instagram, and other social media profiles. Junk food isn't just for carnivores, but how hard is it to succeed when that junk food is fully vegan? The spread of veganism has exploded over the last several years, and one small business called The Bumbling Bee found an opportunity to get itself on the growing list of vegan eateries, pitching itself to the Shark Tank investors. Mom and daughter duo Cassandra and India Ayala brought their vegan burger bar to the tank in 2021. They were hoping that an investment could help them expand their brand across the country and show people that the vegan diet can be more than just rabbit food. 
The pair explained that most vegan restaurants concentrated on what is generally considered healthy foods, and that instead, they were filling the need for vegan junk food. The Bumbling Bee Junk Food and Burger Bar is the new generation of fast food. Their company offers traditional comfort foods like cheeseburgers with plant-based meats and cheeses, loaded fries, and dairy-free milkshakes. The pair asked for $150,000 in exchange for 10% equity, and the sharks were obviously impressed with the food. So, where is Bumbling Bee today? In the tank, entrepreneur Cassandra explained to the sharks how she had grown up in homeless shelters, digging through dumpsters to find food, and was determined to never go hungry again. After the market crash in 2008 wiped out her real estate business, she started in the food industry with a hot dog cart. She was later able to invest in food trucks, and finally, a couple of restaurants near Virginia Beach and in Boulder, Colorado by 2020. By switching the Bumbling Bee's menu over to plant-based foods, she was able to get her three daughters involved in the business as well. Cassandra assured the Sharks that they expected to make more than $324,000 in 2021, despite COVID-related closures. Mark Cuban was concerned that other businesses would copy Bumbling Bee, and given its small size, he worried that it could easily be wiped out by the competition. So for those reasons, I'm out. Ultimately, the Sharks didn't see enough differentiation between Bumbling Bee and any other vegan restaurant to make them want to take the risk of investing. Instead, they recommended that the Ayalas continue to build the business themselves until it was ready to expand organically. They left the tank without a deal. But that wasn't the end. The Bumbling Bee experienced the show's usual effect on sales shortly after its episode aired. They shared on Instagram that their trucks and restaurants were actually now struggling to keep up with the demand for veganized junk food. By June 2021, just months later, Cassandra broke the news that Bumbling Bee was closing its brick-and-mortar locations due to staffing shortages and building issues. However, the business continued to serve its vegan junk food with its two food trucks, Daisy and Dixie, managing to break $1 million in sales. In an interview with WTKR News 3, Cassandra Ayala explained how the Bumbling Bee went on a tour across Virginia, banding together with other food truck businesses and events to drive sales. The Bumbling Bee also joined the VegFest tour in New Jersey, Tennessee, and Georgia. Clearly, they've found no shortage of hungry customers wanting to try their juicy veggie burgers and vegan cheese fries. So is this business still buzzing around today? As of late 2023, the answer is yes. While the business operates solely out of food trucks now, they seem to be doing well. Bumbling Bee continues to make about $1 million in sales each year, placing the business among the top 10% of food trucks in terms of annual revenue. That's pretty good for a company that didn't land a deal on Shark Tank, and makes a whole lot of sense considering the niche market for vegan junk food. Today, the Bumbling Bee's trucks offer various burgers, such as the Boss Barbecue Bacon, chili cheese dogs and fries, loaded fries, various shakes, and a fried chicken sandwich called What the Cluck. What? What the Cluck? Prices range from $7 for an order of nuggets to $16 for a burger. The business also maintains nearly 14,000 followers between Facebook and Instagram, so no one can say that the Bumbling Bee isn't holding its own. As the Sharks pointed out during the initial Shark Tank pitch, the business could very well be just another vegan food truck in a long line of the same. More than 36,000 food trucks operate in the U.S., which means the Bumbling Bee has plenty of competitors. Regardless, Cassandra Ayala has maintained that she's committed to serving up the best vegan burger you can get, and we've already seen just how far her determination can take her. Unfortunately, the Bumbling Bee seems to have made a few false starts. After briefly partnering with the College of William & Mary in the early fall of 2023 to sell food on campus, the business announced on Instagram that it was withdrawing, saying that this particular location was not financially sustainable at this point in time. The food trucks are still going strong, though, with plans to continue visiting festivals, which they announce on Instagram and Facebook. Sharks love meat, but do they also love plant-based meat? 
Mrs. Goldfarb's Unreal Deli was determined to find out. It's no secret that plant-based meat alternatives are on the rise, but there are still many bases to cover. Jenny Goldfarb noticed a gap in the market when it came to sandwich meat. Goldfarb's great-grandfather was a successful deli owner, and she had grown up in New York City, where she gained a deep appreciation for quality cured meats. When she moved to California, she was craving the flavors of her hometown. But Goldfarb had gone vegan, and in 2018, she went on a mission to recreate the flavors of the meaty sandwiches she grew up with, using plant-based ingredients. The first deli meat she mastered was corned beef which she experimented with at length until she got it just right. She incorporated beets, wheat, chickpeas, tomatoes, and a whole host of spices to pack it with flavor. After perfecting the recipe, Goldfarb pitched her product to a Los Angeles deli, and the restaurant promptly purchased 50 pounds. Shortly after, the plant-based deli company appeared on Shark Tank, and even though the company was only a few months old, the sharks had no problem envisioning potential growth. Goldfarb entered the Shark Tank with an impressive and innovative product, but not the highest sales numbers. The company was still very young and had done about $10,000 in sales. The investors were rightfully concerned with the amount of competition from larger companies in the plant-based market. But Goldfarb explained that since she developed the recipe, she brought a lot of value to the table. She was also willing to give up a massive slice. Mr. Wonderful immediately made an offer of $100,000 for 20%, which Goldfarb considered, though she did not give an answer right away. Mark Cuban was especially excited about this product since he is vegetarian and invests in a lot of nutrition-conscious brands. I love it. Yeah. I went vegetarian. Yeah! I'll make you an offer that you know my style, right? As he often does, Cuban jumped in with an ultimatum, offering $250,000 for 20% or nothing. Goldfarb joyfully took the deal. After Cuban invested in Mrs. Goldfarb's Unreal Deli in 2019, the company saw great success. It sold exclusively out of 175 restaurants and delis until the pandemic hit. Unsurprisingly, sales declined significantly during COVID. Cuban told CNBC, we were plummeting to zero. It was a disaster in the making there for a minute. With Cuban's help, the company was able to recover and move into grocery stores with a couple of brand new products, Unreal Roasted Turkey and and unreal steak slices. Despite the setbacks, the company was able to expand into 1,000 stores in 2020. Unreal Delhi ended the pandemic year with $4 million, and Cuban predicted that it would be a $50 million company in a few years. Its next big move was creating pre-made sandwiches in 2021 for people on the go at airports, colleges, and grocery stores. Unreal Delhi's products continued to expand becoming available in thousands of retail locations and restaurants, including Publix, Whole Foods, Quiznos, and Witch Witch. By the end of 2022, company revenues were up to $40 million. It sounds like Cuban's predictions were on track, thanks in part to his support. The brand also decided to take advantage of the growing number of delivery apps and ghost kitchens to create the first vegan sub-shop chain by partnering with Only Plant Based. As of 2023, Unreal Deli has expanded into 400 sprouts markets across the country, and it plans to continue its expansion. Mrs. Goldfarb's plant-based meat sandwiches are now available for delivery in Austin, Denver, LA, New York City, and Raleigh. Unreal knows that picking fan favorites is a great place to start. It has shared recipes for meatless versions of turkey subs, Rubens, and Philly cheesesteaks. The deli meat that Jenny Goldfarb is hoping to develop next might add another sandwich to that lineup, a vegan variety of ham. Goldfarb notes that the enthusiasm for vegan alternatives may bring more flexitarians into the market for Unreal Deli's products, which is an important segment of its consumers. More and more Americans have included meatless options in their diets in recent years, whether or not they fully abstain from meat products, all of which point to a bright future for Unreal Deli. Loved applesauce as a kid, Sanaya's grown-up take on the lunchbox snack promised to make fans out of adults. It may have wowed the sharks, but was it enough to weather the storms of the applesauce market? The company was founded by Keisha Smith-Jeremy, who grew up in the Bahamas eating fruits like guavas and tamarinds. When Smith-Jeremy went on to college at the University of Virginia, she felt a bit homesick and started making applesauce mixed with a variety of Bohemian-inspired flavors to make her feel more connected to her island home. Though her homemade snack was a hit with fellow classmates, 
Smith Jeremy put the applesauce life aside for 20 years to work at a Fortune 500 company before picking it back up and taking a deep dive into the food business. And so I finally decided to take matters into my own hands, introducing Sanaya. Ready to break into the $900 million applesauce market, Smith Jeremy brought her company, Sanaya Applesauce, into the Shark Tank on Episode 2, Season 10 of the hit show. She asked for $150,000 for 15% equity in her business to help with production and distribution. Entered the Shark Tank room with an idea to turn what is predominantly considered to be a snack for children into an adult treat. The sharks were initially skeptical about the viability of the business, but once the panel of entrepreneurs found out that Smith Jeremy's business had already generated a revenue of $40,000 after the first pilot tests, they were intrigued. They also couldn't get enough of her tropical island-inspired guava and green apple-flavored applesauces. Barbara Corcoran initially offered $150,000 in return for 75% of the company, well above the 15% Smith Jeremy was ready to give. But in the end, the business owner accepted Mark Cuban's deal of $150,000 for 25% of the company. Considering Sanaya Applesauce has managed to receive a shark's backing, it seemed like the small business was on its way to turning into yet another million-dollar company. However, the deal with Cuban was never finalized. Nevertheless, Sanaya Applesauce managed to stay in business, at least for a while. Prior to the pandemic, Sanaya Applesauce was thriving, with its products being sold everywhere from Amazon to Walmart to Aldi. But sadly, COVID knocked the applesauce business off course. The pandemic brought about unforeseen troubles, and for a small operation that didn't have a big shark like Mark Cuban backing it, it meant that Sanaya Applesauce was briefly out of business. The company paused all production between 2020 and 2022, and Smith Jeremy returned to the workforce as the head of HR at Tory Birch. In 2021, she was appointed to the board of directors for Unity Software Incorporated, and she planned to use the experience she got from Sanaya Applesauce in her new position. In a press release, Smith Jeremy explained, As someone who works at the intersection of consumer engagement and next-generation retail experiences, I'm really excited to lend my expertise to Unity's future. But soon after quarantine ended, there was good news for adult applesauce fans. Sanaya Applesauce had returned. A publicist for Smith Jeremy and the company confirmed to BizBucket that the unique, flavorful snack was back in stock and being sold once more. According to an Instagram update, Sanaya's unsweetened and guava flavors were available on Amazon. Smith Jeremy reportedly planned on relaunching blackberry, hibiscus, tamarind, lavender pear, and ginger flavors as well. But as of July 2023, it appears Sanaya Applesauce is no longer in business. While it seems as if you might still be able to buy Sanaya Applesauce on my Shopify, it's unclear if this is truly possible, as the company's website and Instagram accounts have both been taken down. Furthermore, the applesauce flavors are listed as currently unavailable on Amazon, along with the description, we don't know when or if this item will be back in stock. Hopefully, Sanaya Applesauce has at least one more big comeback in it, because adult applesauce certainly fulfills a niche market. Business partners Ross Smith and Kwaku Larbi love their coffee, so they created a product that allowed them to take freshly brewed java everywhere. Unfortunately, this hot product left some customers feeling burned. Larbi is originally from Ghana, but studied in the U.S. and received a civil engineering degree from Cleveland State University. Finding himself needing a hot cup of coffee on construction sites, but having no access to nearby coffee shops, he developed the concept and design for Brewmachen and created an early prototype using a 3D printer. Larbi would eventually meet Ross Smith through a social media collaboration. Smith is a viral TikTok star who is known to his almost 24 million followers for donning hilarious outfits and posting videos of his grandmother. Smith believed in Larby's product, so he joined him as a partner. Brewmachen is the world's first fully portable coffee machine that brews six ounces of 190-degree coffee in about five minutes. It uses K-cups or its own refillable pods, and it plugs into a standard home outlet or your car's 12-volt power outlet. Even more ingenious, the brewer also serves as a coffee mug once the java is ready. With preparation less expensive than a trip to the coffee shop, it's designed to save coffee lovers money. As the 
Cinemaholic shares, the Brumachen Brewer is also eco-conscious and sustainable. Instead of plastic coffee pods that take up to 400 years to decompose, the Brumachen Brewer uses biodegradable pods made out of sugarcane that degrade in only 180 days. The device's leaf pods also come in flavors similar to K-Cups, like Morning Blend, Donut Shop, Columbia, and French Roast. Smith & Larby began a crowdfunding campaign for Brumachen in January 2020. Their Kickstarter video features a person brewing a cup of coffee in their truck, along with the slogan, A fresh brew, anytime, anywhere. It piqued the interest of fans, including one YouTube commenter who wrote, I love the idea. I want to buy it today, but I would love to see more information on how to assemble, brew, and what to do once it's ready. Their Kickstarter campaign raised $41,553, which far exceeded the original goal of $6,000. Yet the company encountered problems with manufacturing early on and was unable to ship finished units. In early 2021, the duo appeared on season 12 of Shark Tank, seeking one $1 million for 10% of the business. During the episode, they shared that Brumachen, which retails for $120, costs $38 to make. Sadly, they were not given a deal. The potential investors suggested that the coffee machine needed design improvement and they were not impressed by the number of sales. Mark Cuban opted out first. You're asking for a million and you haven't really shown us anything to, to say you deserve a million. The notoriously harsh Mr. Wonderful Kevin O'Leary also responded negatively, describing Larby and Smith's deal as obscene. I got a million bucks, but you're not getting any of it. Shark Barbara Corcoran later tweeted, I love the idea, but I do have to agree with my fellow sharks. A $10 million valuation is way too high without concrete sales. While he didn't make a deal with the two entrepreneurs, Shark Daniel Lubetsky had nice things to say about Larby, tweeting, Kwaku made a brave move into a new world, very impressed by his drive to pursue his dreams. As of July 2021, the Brumachen brand has been pretty quiet. Several Kickstarter backers said they never received their machine, and those who did said it was faulty. This led many to believe the company would never actually get a functioning single-serve coffee maker to the mass market. Fast forward to 2023, and the brand's website lists the coffee maker as sold out, and on social media, you can only hear the sound of crickets. The business partner's last posts on Facebook and Instagram encouraged fans to watch them on Shark Tank, and the comments aren't very complimentary. One Instagrammer commented on the pair's experience and operations insight, writing, yikes, some people just aren't aren't business savvy. Another chimed in that they couldn't believe the low quality of the product, writing, I was gifted one of these in September 2022. Piece of junk. The world is not a better place with this crappy contraption. Some people may like to enjoy a glass of wine while watching Shark Tank, but this entrepreneur decided to bring hers on the show with her. When Jayla Siciliano appeared on Season 5, Episode 28 of Shark Tank, she was on a mission to change the wine industry with low-calorie wine spritzers. Dubbing her company Bon Affair, Siciliano believed her product would be a hit with health-conscious wine drinkers. The idea for this product came from Siciliano feeling excessively groggy the day after cocktail parties. To remedy this, she began diluting her wine with sparkling water. She fell in love with the blend's taste, which inspired her to create an alternative wine spritzer that would be better for consumers and not leave them with a dreaded hangover. One glass of red wine can contain upwards of 125 calories. Knowing this, Siciliano wanted to create a wine to fit health-conscious lifestyles. Her sparkling wine spritzers contained only 65 calories per glass, but it wasn't just the beverage's low calories that made it unique. Her product had no added sugars, and instead boasted electrolytes to ease hangover symptoms. When Siciliano entered the tank, she confidently assumed the sharks enjoyed drinking wine and that they cared equally about their health. She asked for $150,000 in exchange for 35% of Bonifair. Prior to Siciliano's appearance on the show, her product was available at 10 Whole Foods locations throughout California and had sold $11,000 of product in approximately six weeks. This is a lighter alternative. Think of it as the best sparkling water ever, because it has wine in it. 
While Barbara Corcoran volunteered that she enjoyed wine spritzers, the other sharks didn't share her enthusiasm. After she asked if men drink spritzers too, Kevin O'Leary claimed that men drink a wine spritzer equivalent known as rosé wine with ice. Regardless, Siciliano specified that her target market was working women or busy moms who might like to indulge in a healthier glass of wine. Unfortunately, most of the sharks felt Siciliano's concept either required too much work or wasn't substantiated enough to justify the investment. However, she did end up striking a deal with Mark Cuban, who offered her exactly what she asked. $150,000 for 35% of the company. Shortly after, Cuban helped grow her business to $500,000 in sales, though all of this money had to be reinvested into the company. While the sales numbers looked great on paper, the business was not profitable. When Siciliano appeared on Beyond the Tank, she was gearing up to meet with a large winery that could help her with distribution. The problem? She'd need to devalue her other investors' shares to offer the winery equity. Cuban advised her to offer the distributor the equity on the condition that the new investors meet a sales requirement. Even though Siciliano was nervous, she and the winery eventually reached a deal. To help with sales, Cuban suggested the company come up with a drinking container that could be used in the pool. Siciliano agreed to launch such a product, and the company introduced an aluminum drinking container to its customers. Siciliano ultimately left Bonafair in 2016 to pursue other business ventures. In 2019, the company's blog shared that its wine was available for purchase in Texas, Florida, Maryland, New Hampshire, Arizona, Minnesota, California, South Dakota, and Arkansas. As of 2023, the company is still in business, raking in about $5 million per year. Customers can still find Bonifair products in some Total Wine & More locations, and is available in two flavors, Syrah and Sauvignon Blanc. By 2021, Siciliano had transitioned from Shark Tank entrepreneur to real estate maven. She shared on her Instagram account, my career has zigzagged from corporate to entrepreneur on Shark Tank to becoming a mom, then back to corporate. Siciliano and her husband began investing in vacation rentals before eventually starting their own vacation management company, Atlas Vacation Properties. Before launching her rental business in 2020, Siciliano worked as the vice president of sales and marketing at Seymour Duncan. Her rental business gives her the opportunity to spend more time with family while also allowing her space for creative endeavors. It was sink or swim for two entrepreneurs who entered the tank with a new way to grill while relaxing in the water. Was success just a passing wave or did the float and grill find its sea legs? Having fun on a boat day can work up quite an appetite and feeding hungry boaters can be big business. Float and Grill set out to prove this in Season 12, Episode 24 of ABC Shark Tank. The company sold a single product that shared its name, a lightweight, easy-to-use floating grill with a 1200 BTU propane burner. It provided boaters and their guests with an easy way to cook without ever getting out of the water, saving space on crowded crafts. Founders Mike Bashawati and Jeremy Quillico told the Sharks they developed the idea after purchasing a boat and growing sick of soggy sandwiches and other cold food as their only options for long days hanging out at the sandbar. They developed a prototype and patented a design in 2017 that included features like a fuel tank holder and weight displacement to keep it from flipping. However, they failed to raise the money to further develop it through a Kickstarter. The Sharks initially showed interest in the unique item and its fun viral marketing, but the pitch ran aground when the numbers came into the picture. The Sharks thought $229 was expensive, and they were highly dubious of the year-to-date sales, which were under $20,000 at the time of the taping. Eventually, guest shark Daniel Lubitsky brought up the potential to license the product to a larger grill company like Weber. He offered the inventors $200,000 for 50%, which the two rejected, noting they only owned 70% of the company after taking on previous investors. Mike Bashawati countered with a complex offer involving a $100,000 investment for 20% of the company and a $100,000 loan with a $2 royalty on each unit sold until the loan was repaid. Lubitsky's final offer was $100,000 for 22.5% of the company, a $100,000 loan at 7% interest, and 50% of any licensing deals he helps them secure. Bashawati and Quillico accepted. 
Luckily for Float & Grill's founders, it appears the deal did go through, which is not always a given on Shark Tank. The show was taped in 2020, and nearly a year later, they told the Detroit Free Press that Lubitsky was a cool guy and called working with him a great opportunity. They also praised his team, noting they were always available if the two needed a contact. Float & Grills repeatedly sold out following the show's airing. While a deal on Shark Tank can be a golden ticket for many companies and products, it's no guarantee of success. Despite Lubitsky's and the founders' confidence, the concerns of Mr. Wonderful and the other sharks turned out to be well-founded. The item never became the must-have boating accessory the founders believed it could be. A licensing deal never materialized either. Unfortunately, as of late July 2023, the company's webpage was offline, and its Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram pages were no longer accessible. Additionally, the product's Amazon page listed it as currently unavailable. Therefore, it's safe to assume that Float & Grill is no longer in business or at least has paused operations temporarily. You broke my grill? You broke my grill? As recently as 2022, Float & Grill shared a post on Facebook addressing shipping delays, citing the difficulty in obtaining shipping materials as the cause. Numerous sources mentioned Float & Grill's difficulty keeping the item in stock throughout its existence. This was a relatively common occurrence for many companies in the months and years following the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, which had caused significant disruptions to manufacturing and supply chains. It's not clear whether these difficulties eventually forced the company to close its doors or if there were other issues. Perhaps it was simply a change in direction from the founders that led to the shuttering of operations. There's no word on what Mike Bashawadi and Jeremy Quilico plan to do in the future. A Crunchbase page for Bashawadi lists no other organizations, and Quilico's LinkedIn still shows his most recent position as co-founder of Float & Grill.